Agreeableness is a personality trait that can be described as cooperative, polite, kind and friendly. People high in agreeableness are more trusting, affectionate, altruistic. Agreeableness is one of the five dimensions of personality described as the big five. The other traits are openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion and neuroticism. Whether we realize it or not, most of us are familiar with the three classic responses to fear. Fight, flight and freeze. When our brains perceive a threat in our environment, we automatically go into one of these stress response modes. From an evolutionary standpoint, these responses have served us well by allowing us to respond quickly to threats and get to safety. But for folks who have lived through prolonged exposure to abuse or trauma, often referred to as complex trauma, the treat never feels like it went away, leaving many individuals stuck in different stress response modes. Think of the person who seems to lash out in anger at the slightest provocation, fight, or the perpetually anxious person who avoids interpersonal conflict, immersing themselves in work, flight, or the individual who constantly feels defeated by their inability to make decisions, freeze. These are classic examples of fight, flight or freeze due to trauma. But did you know there's actually a force response? It's called fawn and is a term coined by Pete Walker, a CPTSD survivor and licensed marriage and family therapist who specializes in helping adults who were traumatized in childhood. Fawn types seek safety by merging with the vicious needs and demands of others. They act as if they unconsciously believe that the price of admission to any relationship in the forfeiture of all their needs, rights, preferences and boundaries. These behaviors may be especially prevalent when a survivor feels triggered or fearful. Some of these are people pleasing, being unable to say how you really think or feel, caring for others to your own detriment, always saying yes to requests, flattering others, struggling with low self-esteem, avoiding conflict, feeling taken advantage of, being very concerned about fitting in with others, because fawn types struggle to take up space and express their needs, they are more vulnerable to emotional abuse and exploitation. In abusive circumstances, for example childhood abuse or intimate partner violence, abusers may suppress a survivor's fight or flight response by threatening punishment, leading to the survivor's reliance on the fawn or freeze response. When we lack the power or ability to fight or flee, which occurs commonly with complex trauma, we will freeze, appease or dissociate. The appease response, which is also known as please or fawn, is another survival response which occurs when survivors read danger signals and aim to comply and minimize the confrontation in an attempt to protect themselves.
So this is the extreme form of agreeableness. Dimension of personality, agreeableness, is one of the dimensions that most particularly differentiate men and women. And obviously the differences or similarities between men and women is a matter of hot debate in our society. Um, and, and I want to run through the science that's associated with that. Now, you remember that the big five were derived from a statistical analysis of the content of language, hey? That's kind of interesting because it means that insofar as any psychological theory in the history of psychology has been atheoretical, with the possible exception of intelligence um, research, which was also, the I IQ is also derived statistically. Well, intelligence is a statistical construct, or IQ is a statistical construct. And the big five traits are statistical constructs. And what that means is that there, there are theoretical presumptions that went into their derivation, but it's very difficult to think of them as political because the first hypothesis was only that the fundamental dimensions of personality would be reflected in the language, English to begin with, but then other languages as the research progressed around the world. It's very difficult for me to understand that as a political theory. You know, because if scientific findings have political implications, then you have to wonder if the biases of the researchers put the political implications into the data before revealing them as data. But it's very difficult to argue that. I that happened with trait theories is that the statistical analysis suggested their existence. It wasn't until after the traits were reasonably well identified, and this really started to kick in in the 90s, that we started to understand the potential biological basis and, and even the nature, the descriptive nature of the traits. At the aspect level now, where you differentiate the big five into ten, there's still aspects that that we don't know much about. We don't know, like we don't really understand the difference between politeness and compassion. We know that liberals are more compassionate than, than conservatives and conservatives are more polite than liberals. And we think that politeness is somehow associated with the tendency of conservatives to follow social rule. I started to talk to you about trade theory and now I'm going to make a jump to biology. And that, that's a strange jump in some sense because the two levels of analysis are relatively disconnected. But what's happening right now at the, at the sort of outer echelons of personality research is that the workers at the forefront of the field are trying to integrate what's been established at the statistical level of analysis with what's known at the psychobiological level. And so this emerging science is known as personality neuroscience. and. Um, it's developed in a rather strange way because the traits that were identified that I discussed with you, five traits, all emerged as a consequence of the statistical analysis of, of descriptors, characteristic mostly of the English language, although it's been duplicated in other languages. So, in some sense, it was an atheoretical model, right? It just came out of the linguistic data. So there was no real initial inferences about brain area or neurological activity or, or anything like that to drive the formulation of the Big Five model. In, instead, the Big Five model came first, and then people started thinking, okay, can this be put into alignment with what we know about the brain? There's an incredible amount of data that's come in from animal behavioral research, and as far as I'm concerned, most of the things that we know about the brain have been derived from animal research. Um, the animal researchers tended to be extraordinarily careful scientists. Ledoux is also an, an emotional, he's an affective neuroscientist, so he's a, someone who studies emotions, mostly again animals. And Ledoux has done a lot to sort of add some of the pieces that were missing in, in Gray. Gray probably concentrated a little bit too much on a brain area called the hippocampus, which is the brain area that sort of lets you know 
if it's reasonable to be calm where you're currently situated. And so what the hippocampus does in some sense is compare what it is that you want to have happen with what is happening. And if the two things are the same, then you're calm. So it's a match mismatch detector and it has access not only to memory, but also to formulations of say the desired future. In some sense, that's like cortex versus hypothalamus and you never win. Cortex does not win over hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is what keeps you alive. So that's one of the things that keeps you alive. You could do without your cortex, but you cannot do without your hypothalamus. And the connections stretching upwards from the hypothalamus, which is a very old brain area, are much more powerful than the connections coming down from the cortex to modulate the hypothalamus. And that's another indication of just exactly who's in charge when the chips are down. You know, and that's why it's so hard for you to override your basic emotions or motivational states. It's like the system evolved to keep you alive, and it's not particularly willing to give up control, in a sense, given that your survival is staked on its function. So it's useful to know that because, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you pursue psychology and you stay within the human side of psychology, say, instead of wandering off into the animal behavioral research, you'll see that most human psychologists and neuropsychologists are very corticocentric. They really like to think that it's the newly evolved parts of the brain that are in charge, and that's just not right. The newly evolved parts of the brain are in charge only when nothing is bothering you. Like, if you're not hungry, you're not thirsty, you're not too excited, you're not too curious, you're not too terrified, you know, you're not too cold, you're not too warm, any of those, then the cortex is in charge. But if you deviate substantially across any of those dimensions, the probability that control over your behavioral output and your perceptions is going to devolve down the evolutionary hierarchy to more primordial brain areas is extremely likely. You know, and you see the same thing happens, you know, maybe you're having a discussion with someone, right? And they exhaust the limits of your rational knowledge, which means basically they out-argue you. Well, what happens? Well, usually what happens is that people cry or they get angry. It's like they're out of cortex, it's bang, right down to the more the lower and more primary evolutionarily determined systems. Sometimes in some situations with some people, you really struggle to say no. You really feel compelled an emotional gut level to just avoid the conflict or go with the flow or look like the good guy or good girl and just say yes. You struggle to say no. There are some situations where you find it difficult to put yourself first. You find it difficult, or maybe it induces uncomfortable feelings when you think about what it is that you would want versus what the other person wants, and put that forward and say, no, actually, I'm going to prioritize this. But you struggle to know with precision and accuracy and nuance and depth what it is that you want. You just know there are situations where you're too agreeable. You're too nice. You've got nice guy syndrome, nice girl syndrome, people pleaser syndrome. Not always, but with some people in certain contexts, maybe it's in love, maybe it's in romance, maybe it's in work, maybe it's with certain family members, maybe it's just with like one or two friends and you don't even know why. You just go along with whatever they want. A personality trait, which is agreeableness in one end of the distribution, and something called, sometimes called antagonism on the other end. Um, it's difficult. It's a difficult trait to conceptualize, in my estimation. It's always been the one that's puzzled me the, the most in some ways. And I also think it's the one that gets most obviously troublesome at both ends of the spectrum. So extremely agreeable people are empathetic and compassionate and compliant. But the downside of that is that they are not that good at standing up for themselves and they're and so they're often manipulated and pushed around. And you're not fully in your body. You're, you're, you're removed. For women who've experienced rape and battering and uh, scenes of horror, they understand the 
dissociated state, the trance-like state. It's, it, it's part of what's explained in rape trauma syndrome. It isn't quite the same as freezing, uh, as meaning that your body collapses and you're inert. But it's, it's another state of being less than whole. There's also scared speechless. What does that mean? Well, there are studies that show that there isn't quite the same blood flow to the speech centers of the brain during certain times of shock and trauma. Uh, that may not be adaptive. It may be if, uh, if speaking at that moment would get you in trouble. But there are many different manifestations that have separate brain explanations that all are states of being less than verbal and coherent and competent and active. And, and I, th I think this sensitive group of writers within the Gift From Within community are talking about this and exploring it because they're so accustomed to being intellectual and able to put things into words. And they're describing these various forms of silence that characterizes the human response to extreme stress. And my experience clinically has been that agreeable people, the consequence of their compliance is that they tend to be resentful. Because just because you're agreeable and compliant doesn't mean that at some level of your psyche, you're not interested in a fair deal. And if you're not particularly good at negotiating for yourself, especially in the presence of disagreeable or antagonistic people, then you're going to be left with the short end of the stick. You might think that, you know, because our, 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 what would you say? Our society is at the moment tilted towards regarding agreeableness as a virtue, you know, because you should be kind and you should be empathetic and you should be compassionate and all those sorts of things. But our research this isn't published yet because it's complicated to, to communicate and we haven't figured out how to do it yet. But what we've found is that if you push any of the um, traits too far, they fall off a cliff fundamentally. So if you get too agreeable, then you're dependent and you can't make decisions and so on. And, but then in the middle range, it, it gets more complicated because then agreeableness, where you're located on the normal distribution, how good that is depends to some degree on what it is that you are going to do. So one of the ways to think about how to maximize your success in life is to attempt to match your personality to the environment. Okay? Because our culture is very um, likely to assume that most of the differences between people are cultural in origin. And almost none of the data show that. What they show is that as at least as your culture becomes more egalitarian, which is hypothetically what you're aiming at, the differences, gender differences, for example, not only become more biological because you've eradicated all the cultural difference, but they also become more pronounced. So, for example, the gender differences between men and women are largest in the most egalitarian societies like Norway and Sweden and so on. And so the, the theory there is that, well, once you've eradicated all the environmental differences, all that are left are the genetic differences. And so that sort of echoed in a weird finding in families. So, you know, you might think that if how you raised your children mattered, then children who were raised well would be more similar than children who were raised badly, because that would reflect the effect of your parenting, right? So you've done a good job as a parent, so your children are more similar, whereas someone who just ignored them, those children are different. But that's actually the opposite of what happens is that the children that are neglected are more similar and the children who are attended to well are more different. And the reason for that, I think, is the same reason that we see more pronounced differences in egalitarian societies, which is if you care for your children, it means that you make a very individual relationship with each of them. So you're not necessarily using the same strategies for each child. Unless you think of them as meta strategies and like a meta strategy might be, well, I get to know you and I get to know you. And because you're different people, I react differently to you. And what's, what constitutes my philosophy of parenting would be act differently towards the children's differences. And so 
maybe if you're particularly good at that, your children turn out maximally different from one another. And that's because you're allowing their genetic differences to manifest themselves. You're not oppressing them, you know, and trying to cram them into the little box that you think that they should fit in. The talk is on Alice Miller. Um, she is a Swiss psychologist. And the book that I, the two books that I read were um, For Your Own Good and Free From Lying. In those books is that what passes for ordinary, decent, good parenting is actually pretty abusive. So she did some research and she conducted her surveys in five different countries. And she found out that pretty much across the board, she got the same result, which was that she did this study in 1980. And she asked people if they thought that the corporal punishment of children, that is spanking, was justified. And 90s, or a good idea, recommended practice. And 97% of people in 1980 said yes, that that was necessary for good parenting. And in fact, as late as 2016, we had 250,000 children in the United States who were also spanked in public schools with the permission of their parents. So children are, let me remind you, vulnerable small, helpless, dependent. <laughs> and for a small child, the parent is really their whole world. Children take their experiences and normalize them, no matter what they are. And so, um, what does she mean by abuse? So she says, purposely causing someone shock, physical pain, fear, and shame. And that um, it can also be verbal, so threatening and uh, labeling, name calling, that kind of thing. Parents, teachers, and other caregivers often practice such methods to influence the children's behavior. She says that parents do that because it was done to them, and then it becomes a cycle. So she says, we must not forget that the consequences of early invisible injury are so severe precisely because they derive from the trivialization of childhood suffering. Adults can easily imagine that they would be horrified if they were attacked by a raging giant. Yet, we assume that small children will not react the same way. Um, and also that when parents hit their children, they usually accompany it with verbal abuse, such as threatening, <coughs> labeling, or forcing the child not to cry, right? Um, so children need loving, calm, and consistent correction, but they don't need corporal punishment or uh, verbal humiliation. There is not a reason to hit, slap, smack, jerk, shake, choke, or otherwise lay a hand um, on a child in anger. And all different euphemisms for um, spanking is really hitting. So children mostly learn through observation, and the best way to teach a child to be calm and to be kind is to be calm and to be kind. She did her research studies in France, Germany, Switzerland, Australia, and the United States. Okay, that same study that found that 97% of people hit their children, she asked what age did they begin to hit their children? 80% said eight months. So I don't know why somebody would be hitting an eight month old, so I had to kind of think about what kind of thing would prompt somebody to anger. And what I'm coming up with is maybe when they're not reaching for things on the coffee table that you don't want them to touch, or they s s swat all their food onto the ground. I think every parent here has experienced that. A whole lunch is now on the, on the floor. Um, and what we know to do is to change the, change the environment to support the child so that the child basically can't get into trouble. Um, the child, she says, the child, this isn't a quote, but this is a paraphrase, that the child denies his own self because the parent must always be right. 
The child is, a depend is dependent on the idea that the parents know what they're doing. And the child can't think, my parent is frustrated um, and has no other tools in his or her toolbox. And that's why he or she is thinking. So the child thinks, I am the reason my parent is hitting me, and I must deserve to be hit. I am bad. As a very small child, it's not possible to critique your parent's choices. But looking back on it now, you can realize that receiving corporal punishment should not have happened. You need to experience outrage on behalf of your tiny self, because a price for not acknowledging what happened is repression. Do better if you could and you, and, and you knew, but you can't, and you don't know, and you feel like you've hit a blind spot or a weak spot, like a muscle weakness. You've got full range of motion everywhere, but if I ask you to do this, you, you freeze. You're just like, wow, I, I can't do that. And it feels muscular. It feels neurological. It feels like there's just a place you're just not capable of going to. So people pleaser syndrome was the thing I always used to use as a term. It's a, it's a little weak because if the problem was only that you were a people pleaser, we'd be very lucky, like if that's all it is. If we say codependent, most people think that that's a clinical term and it kind of sounds clinical. It's not. It's not a clinical term. You may sort of think, well, codependency is something that the partner of a drug, of an alcoholic or a drug addict does. Well, I'm not, I'm not in partnership with anybody and they're certainly not a drug addict and they're certainly not my partner is certainly an alcoholic, so I'm not a codependent. As I say, so codependent might be the wrong term. People pleaser is too weak. If I was going to say, okay, let's be really sober, really clean with our language and use the psychological terminology, it would be you're too high in trait openness. You're too high in trait agreeableness. You are, let's say, trying to use the psychology terminology, neurotically agreeable, neurotically open, but not all the time, only in certain contexts with certain people. What would we call that? Entrained dormatory? Entrained pushovery? Where's this coming from? You know, if you're a pushover in certain scenarios, or you're too passive or too agreeable, what is that? What happened is repression. Displaced anger, anxiety, and sadness. If at the time there was someone to be a witness for you, another parent, a sibling, a teacher, a doctor, a therapist, someone who could say, this is wrong, it would have been helpful. But our society colludes with the parent. You can be your own witness today, or talk with someone else, a friend, a therapist, but watch out and see how whoever you're talking to, they also have the need to repress what happened to them, to normalize it, and um, you want to make sure that you are not encouraged to forgive if forgiving means repressing, uh, refusing to look at your own pain. Forgive it. Or don't forgive it. But the critical step is to be there for that small child that you once were that was treated unfairly. Now, I'd like to add my own touch. This is my thought on Alice Miller's. I believe it is not a far leap from the belief of the small child, I am bad and deserve to be punished, to I am a sinner and deserve to be punished. Catholics say when they're about to receive communion, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. Why are two million Christians, two with nine zeros after it, Two million people engaged in a blood cult based on the idea of human sacrifice. Saying things like, he took my place on the cross. 
Nevertheless, you do hear Jesus died for you. I think we've all heard that. It had me wondering, why does that resonate with people? I believe that it is because, as a very small child, when a parent has lost control and is spanking, there is a fear of mortal danger. So a scapegoat is needed. Alice Miller's perspective is that the scapegoat becomes the Jews during the Holocaust. It becomes our own children as we reenact what happened to ourselves as children and when we become the totalitarian parent ourselves. I want you, if you are here today, to live free of the past. Grieve for the child you once were. Now maybe your parents were no worse than many others and even did the things they did out of love. You may have been pressured to forgive them in other churches, but here we don't do forgiveness if that's a word for repression. You can forgive or not forgive as you choose, but first you need to look at the things and realize it can't hurt you anymore. But it can hurt if it is buried in the shadow part of yourself and leaking out in dangerous ways. Forget forgiveness until you've grieved first. To a child, it was scary, bewildering, and it was a violation of your trust. You deserved better. But as human beings who are trying to make our way in this world, in this time, what well, is relevant and is pertinent and is of the moment and is of some urgency, and relevancy to all of us right now is to ascertain where we stand on this spectrum and to see if there is a problem. If we have a weak sense of individualized self and we have porous ego boundaries and we're too agreeable where it really doesn't serve us to be and we really struggle to know what we want as individuals, not as collectives, because this is the time we live in. People are being entrained subtly, sometimes covertly, sometimes overtly, sometimes implicitly, sometimes explicitly, to think of themselves as part of a collective. I wonder if you really want a society to do that. You know, like, what kind of society do you want? Do you want a society where everyone is allowed to be who they are, so to speak, and to be successful at that? Or do you want a society that does everything it can to make people the same, regardless of their individual, you know, of the individual differences that are intrinsic to them. It is by, by no means obvious that that's what you want. Wicked social engineering to eradicate these differences. And it looks like the social engineering that you'd have to do would run counter to egalitarianism, right? Because it, since egalitarianism seems to heighten the differences, it only makes sense that you'd have to run counter to egalitarianism to reduce them. So.